Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah alamin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. We are gathered here today to attend the part two of the session Return and Repent. Now let's start the session with the Kirat by Sister Sophia. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هل أتاك حديث الغاشية وجوه يومئذ خاشية عاملة ناصبة تَسْلَى نَارًا حَامِيَةً تُسْقَى مِنْ عَيْنٍ آنِيَةٍ لَيْسَ لَهُمْ طَعَامٌ إِلَّا مِنْ ضَرِيعٍ لَا يُسْمِنُ وَلَا يُغْنِي مِنْ جُوعٍ وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاعِمَةٌ لِسَاعِهَا وَاضِيَةٌ في جنة عالية لا تسمع فيها لاغية فيها عين جارية فيها سرر مرفوع وأكواب موضوع الغنمارق مسفوفة وذرابي مبثوثة أفلا ينظرون إلى الإبل كيف خلقت وإلى السماء كيف رفعت وإلى الجبال كيف نصبت وإلى الأرض كيف سطحت فذكر إنما أنت مذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر إلا من تولى وكفر فيعذبه الله الأذاب الأكبر إن إلينا إيابهم ثم إن علينا حسابهم صدق الله العلي العظيم Jazakallah, sister, for your presentation. Now, before we move on to the session, I welcome Sister Atiba to give us an introductory talk. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahmani r-Rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما رب زدني علما رب زدني علما I welcome all of you my brothers and sisters to our ninth session of IPD Islamic Personality Development Companions of Jannah This session is continuation of the eighth session which is about return and repent in which we learned about this hadith there is no believing servant except that he has a sin which he commits from time to time or a sin in which he persists in and does not abandon until he leaves this world indeed the believer was created as one who is frequently tried and tested who often repents then forgets when he is admonished he accepts admonition this hadith is misinterpreted by people, so it's really very necessary to understand it deeply. Alhamdulillah. In last session, we learned about this hadith that how shaitan plays with us so smartly to fall in his trap to commit sin. And Alhamdulillah, we learned how to repent too. So inshallah, we will continue uh, to understand deeply about this hadith. May Allah help us to get benefited by this session and give us the to put it into action totally for sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah reward every one of us for the effort, guide us and make us companions of Jannah Ami. Before that, please keep your social media notifications off. 
Keep away anything that can distract your attention. Keep your ears, eyes, hearts, and your notebook open with pen and ready to be benefited and be sure your mic and videos are off and be ready to interact through chat box whenever is needed. And most importantly, pure your intention. So without taking more time, I would like to call Brother Wafi to start his insightful session. Over to you, Brother Wafi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه إجمعين أما بعد الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم وملقي التوبة على الندم ونشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه إجمعين أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلل أقدة من لساني يفقح قولي قال الله تعالى في قرآن الكريم في سورة الزمر قل يا عبادي الذين اسرفوا على أنفسهم لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم This is actually one of the most beautiful verses I've ever laid my eyes upon. It's so beautiful. And this verse often is a verse that provides a sense of energy, a sense of hope to millions and millions of people. Millions and millions of people just like us in flesh and blood who are at the deepest parts of life, who are at the rock bottom, who are at the rock bottom. Being in the counseling field, I have met people who are really, really have hit the rock bottom of life. They're depressed, they're anxious, they have lived a life of jahala. They have never cared about prayer. They enjoyed their college life, so to say. They went to nightclubs, they went to DJ parties. And in the end, you know, once they get an awareness and a realization of how important life is, they try to turn back. But whenever they try to do it, Shaitan puts a lot of negative thoughts into their minds. Shaitan tells to them, you have done this and that. You have danced in your college to vulgar and wild music. You have gotten into relationships that went very deep, and that were very haram. You have lied a lot to others and to yourself. You have acted a lot. You have been a hypocrite in your public life and in your personal life. There was a contradiction, a clear contradiction between what you said and what you did. There was a clear contradiction between what you practiced and what you preached. And this applies to every single human being that is alive today and every single one of us, brothers and sisters, gathered here. This verse offers us an intense amount of positive energy. And I want you guys to read this ayah along with me. And then after reading it, type yes in the chat. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم I wanted to recite it. If you could, you know, try to recite it and not just read it. I wanted to recite it, but I'm a bit sick today. Alhamdulillah, I'm able to read. So uh, try to read it along with me. 
After you have read it, type yes in the chat. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ It's really beautiful. And you know what's really, really beautiful in this? If we have a linguistic analysis, and this linguistic analysis doesn't take, you know, much deeper uh, Arabic knowledge, you know, just a peripheral knowledge is enough. You know, if, uh, if you know, uh, your friend has done something against you, there's a certain way you address them. If you have done something against your father or your mother, they would address you with a certain label or they would call you your name, right? I know you, many of you would be able to relate, you know, uh, often, I don't know if it is there in other cultures, but you know, for us in the Kerala culture, in the Desi culture, this is like quite often, like they call our like full name, right? They call our full name when they're angry. Uh, like, you know, I'm talking about the parents and like, you know, our, our mothers and fathers, right? In childhood, if your name is Wafi, then they'll probably call you the full name, Wafi Jihad, come here, right? Like they call the full name. Why do they do that? You know, just to Just to get the full effect, right? just to get the full effect, right? And then there are other parents like who use, like, you stupid, you idiot, you come here, okay? Being a parent, one should not be using that, you know, label because it can really affect the children, right? Now, there are different ways people address other people when they have, you know, done something wrong. But here, look at how Allah addresses a person who might have done every fahisha we could think of, every kind of thing that we could think of. You know what Allah calls them? My servants. My servants. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِي عِبَادِي There's a يَا بَعْدَ دَال which basically refers to ownership or you know something that we consider mine. Mine. O oh, my servants who have transgressed against their own souls. So every single sin that we do we are actually transgressing against who? We are transgressing against who? What do you think? Do you think Allah is going to get hurt uh, uh, because, you know, we commit a sin? What do you think? Who are we really hurting by committing sins? I want everyone to answer in the chat. Absolutely. Every single sin that we commit, we are actually hurting ourselves. It is not, it is not decreasing from the treasury of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't even decrease an atom. Each time we commit a sin, we are actually affecting ourselves. And let me tell you this, something that is very important. A lot of sins that we commit, thinking that it's not going to have any consequence, it will have a consequence. It will have a consequence. It can be a spiritual consequence. It can be a physical consequence. It can be a psychological consequence. It can come in different ways. But what, whatever it is, if Allah has made something a sin, then of course it will have consequences. And sometimes when we apply our minds with a materialistic and naturalistic paradigm, we'll not be able to completely understand what the negative consequence is. You know, this can you know, be understood with a very you know, simple analogy. You know, imagine that you have a child, you know, a very small kid, maybe uh, three years old or four years old, and the small kid, you know, often they want to eat chocolates or sweets, right? And imagine you went to a supermarket, you went to a supermarket and you were trying to, you know, buy your stuff and your child is with you, sitting on the trolley or, you know, just walking with you. The moment they get into the chocolate, you know, cat, you know, area, what would they do? They'll try to grab the chocolates as much as they can, right? And of course, like the parents, they will, they will pull back all the chocolates and put them back into the place. And when that happens, like the child starts getting really, really angry. The child starts crying. They st you know, they try to make a scene, right? Like, like <laughs> it's a really ugly scene to actually watch. Like children, like they'll make up a lot of scene because of why they're not able to get the chocolates. Now, what is the problem with a child eating a chocolate or eating multiple chocolates? What is the problem? Now, from the perspective of the child, like, it's no problem. I mean, if the child could talk, imagine Allah gave children really powerful linguistic abilities. 
if Allah gave them really powerful linguistic abilities, like they would start giving, you know, arguments, like saying, what is the, the, the problem with, you know, eating chocolate, eating chocolates are really good, eating chocolate uh, uh, triggers dopamine and neurotransmitter releases in, the, in your brain, and it leads to happiness, it'll decrease depression, it'll do this, it'll do that, you know, they could actually give a lot of scientific labels for, you know, uh, promoting eating chocolates. But the child, he's speaking from inexperience. While the mother, the mother has a wider perspective. The mother has the picture while the child only has the pixel. The child doesn't fully understand. But for the mother's mercy, due to mother's mercy, she tells her, she tells to the child, no, my son, no, my daughter, you can't eat that. You can't eat that. Now imagine the child, you know, goes beyond that stage and he or she is very adamant and eats, imagine 10 chocolates, Snickers and, you know, Mars and, you know, all those, these chocolates. If the child does that, who is the child really harming? Who is the child really harming? Is the child ha harming the, the parent? Is the child harming the supermarket, the shopkeeper? No, the child is harming himself or herself. A similar situation is with us all human beings. And human beings, we are a bit more arrogant. You know, the adults, we are a bit more arrogant than children. Just because, you know, we have acquired a little bit more intelligence, just because we have achieved a little more rational and uh, logical faculties, just because we have studied a little bit more biology, physiology, psychology, anthropology, philosophy, physics, chemistry, and other subjects, we think that we have gotten the picture. But still, the truth is we only have the pixel. We only have the pixel. There are a lot of sins that are being actively promoted on the social media with a lot of different arguments, with a lot of different labels, with a lot of different logics. The lot of different logics. This can be very clearly seen, especially because we live in a liberal world where they're trying to justify each and everything. Right? For example, with regards to relationships, there are a lot of people who get into relationships and I've been getting a lot of messages on Instagram. It's quite sad to actually see, you know, people getting into this stuff. They're trying to justify it to themselves. They say, what is a big problem with this? I'll make it halal after two years or three years. Like, come on, like, how can it damage me? Right. And the same people like who might have gotten into relationships, you know, not taking heed to your warnings in the first year of college. Like before, like it comes to the third year, they have just completely destroyed their mental health. Like they're psychologically hurt. And love is a very powerful emotion. If you're hurt due to love, that pain is going to be there. That pain is going to be there. It's really going to be there. Like even if it's a lot of years, that pain is going to be there. I speak with the experience of having talked to multiple people who have trapped themselves in the quagmire of relationships. For them, in the first year of getting into relationships, regardless of how much we tell them, come on, this is wrong, come on, this is problematic, come on, this will affect you, they won't take heed because this emotion has gotten into their minds. But then after that, you know, after the breakup happens or whatever happens, you know, they're completely destroyed. It's a very, very sad reality. See, have you seen such people? If you have seen such people, say yes in the chat. It is very sad to see. It's very sad to see. Each and everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram, it is haram because it will destroy you. And maybe, you know, because of our limited, you know, view, we may not completely see the effect of it. And then, you know, the liberals, they promote pornography. And they say pornography is all right. It's for sexual education, they say. Subhanallah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Even like we have a lot of research papers that clearly show that this is harmful to them. But then, no, they give really stupid arguments, really baseless arguments to actually promote their vulgar, as nine and filthy ideologies. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So what we need to understand from this ayah is that each time we commit a sin, we are actually transgressing against our souls. Even the little sins that you say, uh, sorry, the little lies that you say, that we say, the lies, you know, often we think that it's it's not that problematic. I mean, what's the big deal if I tell my teacher that I didn't do the work because I was ill, but in fact, I was lazy? What is a big deal? What is a big problem? 
with actually, you know, going to Onam celebration. And, you know, one person really did ask, like, they messaged and they said, come on, Wafi, like, why are you such an extremist? Why are you such a fanatic? Why are you such a fundamentalist? Like, what's the big deal with wearing a dress code and going to college and just enjoying ourselves? These people, they often look at life from a very, very limited perspective, from a very immature perspective, you know, for the lack of a better word. They don't understand the consequence that it's going to have on their spirituality, on their life, and on their mentality, in the way they, they, they perceive life as a whole, is definitely going to have an effect on you. And just like, you know, we discussed in the last class, shaitan pulls you step by step, and we may not understand what these steps are. We may not be very readily able to perceive that this step is directly going to lead to problems. No, he's not going to understand. You're not going to understand it. But you know, he being a bit more wiser than you because he has been observing you from the day you were born, he knows what steps can basically destroy your life inside out. All right, now coming back to the ayah, Allah is speaking directly to the souls that have transgressed against themselves, to the souls that have violated their own purity for each and every one of us, because none of us is perfect. We might have committed sins here and there, knowingly or unknowingly. Allah is talking directly to us and he's saying, La taqnatu min rahmatillah. It's a very, very beautiful, it's a very, very powerful verse. It's a very, very powerful verse. I want each and every one of you to close your eyes. To close your eyes. Now follow my voice. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Now keep your eyes closed. And I want you to think about two sins that you have committed that nobody in the world knows. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about it. And this should be a sin that is eating you inside apart. And you know that this is a huge sin. You know that this was a huge problem. You knew that this was, you know, a huge, huge problem, but yet, you know, shaitan prompted you to do it. I want you to think about such a sin. The time you committed it, or the times you committed it, the place you committed it, and the intensity with which you did that particular sin. I want you to think about each and every detail of, your, of, of the sin in your mind. And then I want you to repeat 10 times. La taqnatu min rahmatillah to yourself in your heart. If you can say it out loud, it'll be much better. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. And it basically means despair not of the mercy of Allah. Say it to yourself 10 times, then slowly open your eyes and then say yes in the chat. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله 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 How beautiful that is How beautiful that is Allah is calling you my slave the Lord of mankind the most powerful being in the universe is calling you my slave and then he's saying لا تقنطوا Don't despair Don't worry man Don't worry bro don't worry. I will forgive you. Just ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. Okay. Now tell me what you felt when you did this exercise. Just type your uh, experience in the chat in a few words. Okay, one person is saying tears are rolling. That is very good. Crying is actually very good. It'll really help you ventilate. It'll really help you ventilate. Now, this is actually ventilation, and it needs to be done. Because usually, sins, they harden the heart. And usually, people who do a lot of sins, they won't be able to cry. They won't be able to cry. So, being able to cry 
It's a very beautiful thing. It's a very beautiful thing. Now, the next thing we need to understand is that we should never ever justify our mistakes. We have already talked about this in the early, last class, right? Did we cover this topic in the last class? I think we did. But, you know, just to, you know, uh, uh, just, just to give you a brief, we live in a liberal world and often we see a lot of people justifying their mistakes. They give it a lot of labels. They give it a lot of scientific, philosophical reasons. A good example of this is the LGBTQ activism. Even today, we have Muslims. We have Muslims who support LGBTQ. LGBTQ. It's quite shocking. It's quite shocking. Something that is very clearly mentioned in the Holy Quran that is haram. There are Muslims who do it. There are Muslims who clearly, clearly justify it. They clearly, clearly justify it. But all of their arguments are really baseless in Islam. They're really baseless in Islam. There are people who have who has written an entire book supporting homosexuality. Imagine that. And you know, I was talking to a liberal, and they came up with that book, uh, Scott Google, and the book's name is Homosexuality in Islam. Like it's a very, very baseless book. Almost all of the LGBTQ activists in the Islamic paradigm used that particular book. And that particular book was like, it, it's really baseless. It's filled with a lot of historical contradictions, historical contradictions, subhanAllah. But a person who is a layman, who doesn't have much knowledge into these things, they will really fall for it if they read this book one time, if they read this book one time. So we need to understand that doing one sin is a sin, but justifying that sin is a bigger sin. And Iblis tried to do it, and that's why he was kicked down. That was, that's why he was banned from Jannah, right? So we got to be really, really careful of this. And the same thing, you know, the same trend is seen with a lot of teenagers, you know, who go and, uh, and uh, you know, celebrate, you know, onam celebration or, or, you know, Christmas celebration, you know, just taking part in their rituals. Let me ask you, is that all right? Is that all right for you to go to a Christmas celebration and stand in front of the idol of Jesus Christ and drink wine all in the name of tolerance and religious harmony? It doesn't really make sense, right? But even then, like these teenagers, like I, I do try my best to understand their, their perspectives. But at the same time, like we can clearly understand hypocrisy. We can clearly understand hypocrisy. These people, okay, celebrating that is one sin. At the same time, what these people don't understand is that justifying that is a bigger sin. Justifying that is a bigger sin, right? So we got to understand the seriousness of this. We got to understand the seriousness of this. And... We talked about the difference between Adam والسلام, and Iblis. Adam committed sin, Iblis also committed a sin, but the way they went forward were very, very different. Now to continue, always have husnul done about people. All right. If a person goes and celebrates or you know joins these festivals, like don't just you know have those very negative like views about them in your mind. Of course, like you're going to have that repulsion. Of course, you're going to have, you know, certain repulsive, disgusting thoughts. At the same time, don't just, you know, write through the entire thought process and, you know, think about them in a very negative manner. You don't know their background. You don't know their background. You don't know their condition. You know, they might be using drugs. They might be, you know, uh, uh, they might be uh, uh, involving in a lot of these things. They might be jumping up and down in the college, you know, maybe going to nightclubs or listening to music and all these things but you don't know their reality. They might be standing in the darkest parts of the night, raising their hands and crying to their Lord. They might probably have a bigger, you know, stature, a bigger daraja, a bigger level in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more than you, you don't know. You don't know their reality. Never ever judge another person. Never judge them, all right? Never judge them. You know, there are a lot of people in our generation who are who are not who did not get you know much of an Islamic education, and I've talked to a lot of such people because they had liberal parents. They may not know it. They may not know like these things are wrong. If we told them these things are wrong, they would clearly you know stop it. They would clearly stop it. They would cl clearly not do it, right? So you don't know their background. You don't know the condition of their heart and their environment. Some people they might be just doing it out of pressure because they're really for seniors telling them if you don't join the celebration we'll just beat the hell out of you we'll smack your head on the bench like i know people like who have come, come to me and complain with regards to these things like they said like there is no way we can't do it otherwise like we'll really get hurt 
like we are in a life and death situation, right? So you don't know their environment. You don't know the condition of their heart. You don't know their background. You don't know their background, right? So never ever judge them. Always have good thoughts about them. Just not learn about them. Always pray for their forgiveness. Be kind towards them. Be merciful towards them. This can be seen in the story of the Sahaba. You know, once the, you know, a man came to them, or a man was walking by, he had wine in his beard. Now, from a common sense perspective, let me ask you, if, like, if you saw wine on the beard of a person, like what you know, common conclusion would you come to? Like common sense, what would be the conclusion? If you saw wine in the beard, like, yeah, he'd drunk, right? Like he has drunk, he has, you know, drunk wine or whatever. Like that's like the common, you know, conclusion that we could come to. It's common sense. It's common sense, right? But the Sahaba, like they started making like amazing excuses for this guy. Okay, maybe, you know, he was walking by and, you know, a drum of, of wine just spilled and a few droplets, you know, they splashed on his, on his beard. The Sahaba went to that accent to actually give excuses for him. Subhanallah. Now, now compare our situation. Compare our situation. Like, you know, we see a person who might have, you know, had a small symptom of sin. And we give them, a football, like we bash out, but we judge them a lot. We judge them a lot. Never ever judge other people. Until you are not God. Who gave you that right? Who gave you that right? Right? Who gave you that right? Now, this is another example that I've taken from the speech of, uh, of the Sharah of uh, Sheikh Ali Hassan al Halabi's Arba'un al Hadith fi Shaqsiyat al Islam. And this, you know, a particular uh, example like that hit the point home. If you saw a prostitute in night walking down the street, and now this is a prostitute, she's committing a huge, huge crime. One of the Sabah al Mubiqat, it's Zina. If you saw a prostitute in night walking down the street, you're still not allowed to think bad about her. Subhanallah. Like that's the extent to which we're supposed to think good about other people. Right? You're not supposed to think bad about her. You're not supposed to think what a bad woman she is. What a wild, vulgar, filthy woman she is. She's committing the greatest of sin. How shameless she is. No. You know what you're supposed to think? You're supposed to think if Allah had given her half of the things he gave me, she would have been in a better position than me. If Allah gave her half of the awareness he had given me, if Allah gave her half of the opportunities to learn Islam that he gave me, she would have been an alima. She would have been in a much better position than me. And you should think positively about her and you should pray for her guidance. This is who we are as supposed to be Muslims. But sadly, the situation is not like that. If we see a lady like who is doing something, or you know, or, or you know, a, a brother who is doing something, like we know, he might be doing. We are still not sure. We just bash out. We spread the information. We backbite. We rip into the dignity of this brother or this sister. Subhanallah. It's a very, very sad reality. It's a very, very sad reality. So we should have personal fun about people. We should have personal fun about people. Don't hate the sinner. Hate the sins. Don't hate the sinner, hate the sins. Like this is a very, very important concept that we should keep in our minds. That we should keep in our minds. Now, now there's another aspect to this and we'll talk about this aspect. A lot of liberals, they take this particular statement and they go to the other extreme, right? So we have two extremes. On the one side, we have people like who just completely hate the sinners to, like, to the extent that they want to hurt them. But on the other side, we have liberals who try to take these, you know, beautiful concepts of Islam and they completely misinterpret it. They completely misinterpret it to the extent that it's completely all right to commit sins. Right? We'll talk about that very soon. But, you know, there's something else we need to properly understand. And that is that, that is that we all commit sins one way or the other. It can be small or it can be big sins. So never be self-righteous. If you see another person committing sin, or not as righteous as you, don't have that sense of self-entitled, self-sanctimonious, self-righteous superiority complex. The Holy Quran really clearly says, La fusakum. don't you know, claim yourself to be pure. Don't claim yourself to be pure. Allah knows your situation more than you know it. The people may not know it, 
your mother, your father, your husband may not know it, your wife may not know it, your brothers and your sisters may not know it, but Allah knows it. Allah knows the condition of your heart. So don't raise yourself to the level that you are not in, that you are not in. You know, I went to Imam Shafi's, uh, you know, qabr here. I mean, his masjid. Uh, his graveyard is actually beside his masjid. I, I went to Imam Shafi's masjid and uh, it's actually near to the place that I'm studying. I'm sitting on the uh, scholar called uh, Sheikh Sama Abdul Azim, and if we drive the bike about 10 to 15 minutes, we could, you know, get to the Masjid of Imam Shafi'i. And outside the Masjid of Imam Shafi'i, like there is there is a, a very important quote. And let me remind you, who was Imam Shafi'i? Imam Shafi'i was one of the greatest scholars ever to walk on earth. Imam Shafi'i is a mastermind, a literal mastermind. If Imam Shafi'i was actually a scholar of physics, he would have been known as one of the best scientists of physics or chemistry or other fields. In Islam, he applied his master intellect to it. And he basically built the, the, the usul fiqh, the, the, the foundations of the entire field of jurisprudence. Subhanallah. Like that's how amazing Imam Shafi'i was. Even from his childhood, right from his childhood, he was a scholar. He had, he had massive amount of knowledge. Imam Shafi'i was such a person. And Imam Shafi'i, you know what he says? I love the righteous while I'm not, you know, among them. If Imam Shafi'i felt that he is not among the righteous, I mean, what, what ounce of a chance do we all have? Think about it. Like, really, really think about it. Really, really think about it. So don't consider yourself to be a very righteous person, all right? It can lead you to arrogance. It can lead you to arrogance. But at the same time, don't go to the other extent. All right, the people go to the other direction and say, I'm a loser, I'm a weak person, I'm this and I'm that. And they just constantly bash out to themselves in a very negative manner. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Like, why are you hurting yourself for no reason? Is shaitan playing with your mind? Is shaitan playing with your mind? So don't go to either of these extremes. And we'll talk about, you know, these, these extremism in both the paradigms very soon, inshallah, when we talk about the topic of moderation. All right. The thing is, your sin may not be going to the college and, and partying with, you know, other people in the college. Your sin may not be drinking alcohol and taking drugs. But your sin might be thinking that you are above everyone else. Your sin might be you thinking that you're more righteous than everyone else. You might be praying five times a day, but that doesn't give you the, 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 the license to judge other people and think that you're the best think that you're the best. I know a lot of people like, who pray five times a day, they might have beers, they might have niqabs, but each time you talk to them, the only thing they have to talk about is, of course, I do understand, like, it's, it, it might be coming from a good concern, a concern, a positive concern about the society, good intentions, but they say, come on, look at this guy, look at that guy, they've been doing this and they've been doing that. SubhanAllah, don't do that. Don't do that. Never think that you're above other people. All right? And this was actually the first sin that was ever committed. The first thing that was ever committed, right? In, in Christian theology, in Christian theology, there is a concept of original sin. Does anyone know what original sin is? Does anyone know what original sin is? The concept of original sin? Original sin. Now, it's actually a concept in Christian theology. The original sin was, you know, Adam eating the apple. Like that was the first sin ever committed, right? But in Islam, the, the first sin was not committed by a human being. It was actually committed by Iblis himself. The first sin was not eating the apple. The first sin was Iblis thinking he was superior to Adam. Let me tell you, you know, Iblis was actually an alim. All right? Iblis was an alim. Iblis was a person who had a lot of knowledge. He was very righteous. He used to, he used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you know what was the reason for him falling down? It was because of his arrogance. Him thinking that he's better than everyone else. He says to Allah when Allah says to him to bow down. He says to Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, you made me from fire and you made that guy from soil. How dare you tell me to bow down to him? I'm better than him. Subhanallah, he says I'm better than him. This is arrogance. This is arrogance. 
So when you have such thoughts in your mind, be very, very careful of such thoughts. Be very, very careful of such thoughts. And there's a clear cut hadith that says, a person who has an ounce of pride in his heart, he will not enter Jannah. He will not enter Jannah. So we've got to be really careful. We've got to really be careful. And there are a lot of people I know back in my homeland. And personally, I've met a lot of these people. But I'm not generalizing. But I'm just stating that I've met these people like who might have studied this deen maybe for a few years. They wear a special dress. They wear, you know, you know, they, they feel like, you know, they should get special privilege, right? They should get special privilege. And they think that they are above everyone else. The way they talk to other people, the way they deal with other people, they just think that because, you know, they have learned a bit of deen or maybe because they have a beard, they are like, they have reached the stage of awliya. That is what these people think, subhanAllah. And here, you know, uh, you know, while I'm studying under the Sheikh Osama Abdul who used to be a professor of Azhar University for 30 years, like he's one of the biggest scholars here in Egypt. I'm just amazed. I see Sheikh Osama sleeping on the floor of the masjid, just like all of us, eating the food. Like we wake up for suhoor and we take fast. He eats the same food as us. Like he just puts himself on a level like, of his students of his students, subhanAllah. Very, very humble. A person with intense humility. Intense humility. And that is actually the result of, of, of knowledge going into the heart rather than knowledge just going into the mind and you becoming an information processing and storing system, subhanAllah. Anyway, I'm just mentioning it. Don't generalize. I'm not saying that all scholars are like that. All right. There are a lot of amazing scholars back in my homeland who are very humble, who have a lot of humility, mashallah. Okay, so never ever be self-righteous. It's a big sin. And never ever speak condescendingly about people who commit sins. All right? Unless they are repeated offenders harming the society. All right? Try to hide the sins of other people. Don't, you know, make excuses for them. Don't just publicize their sins. There are some people, if we tell them that this person and that person has committed a sin, like they're like, you know, BBC News. They'll just broadcast it internationally. Right? <laughs> They'll just broadcast it internationally. Don't do it. Why are you talking about the sins of other people? Why are you talking about the sins of other people? If you saw a sister not wearing hijab, go to her and speak to her. Go to her and speak to her. All right? Don't just post on social media, you know, clicking their picture and saying, like, this sister, you see, this sister, she's a feminist. She's doing this. She's doing that. No. Like, who gave you the right to do that? Who gave you the right to do that? Don't do it. Don't do it. Right? Speak to them. And when you speak to them, don't even speak in a condescending manner. And this is one thing that you really, really need to understand when you're giving advices. Imagine that you saw a sister. Imagine that you saw a sister who is not wearing hijab. All right. I'll give you two options here. Number one, you go to her and you, sell, you tell her, Ya Dhal, Ya Mudil, Ya Mujrim, Ya Harami. You're doing this and you're doing that. You feminist, you feminazi, you militant, you arrogant. What are you doing here? Like, how dare you not wear the hijab? Like, are you shameless? Are you like, shyless? Like, this is, the, this is the value that your parents have given you. Get out of the college. Like, subhanAllah, and you just lash out of them. Right? You just lash out of them. What effect do you think it is going to have on her? Do you think that she is going to wear the hijab? All right. If she was wearing a small shawl around her you know, neck, she's probably going to take that and, you know, beat you up. <laughs> subhanAllah. Like, no, like, even if, like, imagine, even if she wanted to accept what you were saying, you, you, she will never accept it. She will never accept it because of your tone and the way and the other that you have shown. Sure. Never ever approach another person who is doing sin in this manner. Don't speak to them in a condescending manner. All right. The other option is this you're going to the sister and you're telling her, Dear sister, Allah gifted you with Islam. And a lot of people don't have this gift. And in this gift, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a lot of regulations in order to protect us from a lot of these different things. And then you tell her the wisdom behind hijab and you then prove to her jurisprudentially and rationally and logically and Islamically and spiritually how beautiful hijab is and how it helps her improve and how she becomes courageous and a bit more confident if she starts wearing hijab and how it helps her not needing to fit into the standards, the beauty standards of the society. And you speak to her in a kind manner. Maybe, you know, you, you take her to a coffee shop and you buy her a tea and you speak to her. Okay, I'm, let me clarify. I'm talking about uh, 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 mahrams, all right? 
You gotta be a woman to do this. <laughs> Subhanallah, I should have clarified this at the start. But I'm not talking about boys. Men <laughs> here, don't do this. All right, don't do this. All right, I'm talking about sisters. Sisters, like if you see another sister doing this, like do, <laughs> you know, take her to a coffee shop. If you're a man, don't do it. <laughs> don't, you know, use my name as an excuse to do it. All right, let me clarify this very, very clearly. Very, very clearly. Anyway, if you're a man, like if you see another brother doing drugs, do the same thing. All right, do the same thing. Let's keep the gender <laughs> uh, uh, segregation very clear. Anyway, so advise them in the best of manners. Pray for them sincerely. Prayer is very, very powerful. Pray for them. Praying is very, very important. You know, a lot of people in the debating field, they constantly debate and debate and debate and debate and debate, but they have never ever prayed one sincere dua for that brother to come into guidance. There's actually something, you know, that I, like, I was actually shocked when this actually happened in my life. Uh, I think I was studying in uh, this first year of college. Uh, and you might know the people in Kerala, you might know the debate that happened between Akbar, uh, Imam Akbar Sahib and, uh, and Iyya Jabbar. Does anyone remember that debate? Imam Akbar Sahib and Iyya Jabbar. That was a beautiful debate. Okay, it was a career-ending debate for Iyya Jabbar. He probably drank more water than an entire population or an entire civilization. Anyway, now... Uh, you know, before that debate was happening, like a lot of organizational works were going on, you know, setting up the protocols of the debate and everything. And it was broadcasted by Renai TV. And I was working as a journalist for Renai TV. And uh, uh, like we, we gathered in a hall, we're planning. And uh, another funny thing is I called E.A. Jabbar on the phone. And the guy was, you know, give, trying to give a lot of different excuses. It was a funny experience. Anyway, you know, right after you know, all the works, like we were planning to go, and in the hall, um, the, the director of Rina TV, his name is uh, Yasirka, Yasir Sahib, an amazing brother, uh, uh, you know, a very sincere person who has been working in the field of Dawah for years and years. And, you know, he asked us, okay, now you have, you know, been planning the debate, you know, the protocols of the debate. And like, what is the fundamental objective of the debate? Are, are we trying to smack this guy down? Like, like is, our, is, is the aim of the debate just to, you know, destroy the dignity of another person? Was that the objective of the debate? No, obviously no. And then he asked us, how many of you prayed for the guidance of that guy? Raise your hands. And very few people in the hall raised their hands. So we need to be really thinking. We need to be really, really thinking. Are we doing this very sincerely? If we are advising another person very sincerely, we will do it the most sincere manner, in the most beautiful manner, with the most beautiful adab, the most wise manner, and we will make dua for them. We will make dua for them. That is how we are supposed to approach things. And, you know, this hadith that we, you know, just talked about, the first hadith, the first hadith, and I hope you remember the first hadith that we talked about, like in the last session. The hadith actually sheds light on the core of human fitrah. There are many ayat in the hadith that talks, you know, about human fitrah, human fitrah. Right. So this hadith talks about the internal weaknesses of, of you know, human beings, that they are very prompted to commit sins often. They're very prompted to commit sins often. And the Prophet Sallallahu has a lot of different hadith like that. For example, if the son of Adam had a valley of gold, he would wish for a second. Human being was created with the nature of haste. Human being was created weak, etc. So, you know, it points towards the internal reality, internal human psyche of human beings. Now, what we need to finally understand is nobody is perfect. Okay, let me ask you, are you perfect? Are you perfect? No, you are not perfect. I am not perfect. If you search for a perfect person in the world, you will never get it. You will never get it. Your parents are not perfect. Your brothers are not perfect. They are not perfect. She's not perfect. He's not perfect. We are not perfect. We are not perfect. If you search for a perfect spouse, you're never going to find it. You're never going to find it. And I know people like, you know, who, who, who got into the age of marriage and they've been searching for a spouse for eight years. And, you know, when we talk to them, their parents come and they say, okay, this, you know, girl, this guy, like they're not getting, you know, accepting any proposals. They come to them and then they come for counseling and we talk to them. And the problem is they have extreme like ideal standards, right? Like almost to the level of perfection, almost to the level of perfection. If you're, if you're searching for perfection, you won't find it. Like there is nobody in the world that is perfect. There is nobody in the world that is perfect. Never ever expect perfection from a human being. And this is often another case that comes. 
you know, with regards to love marriages, where in which this emotion of love gets into the, you know, minds of people and they start considering their, you know, partner as perfect. But then after marriage, like they tend to see the weaknesses of their partner and then they get divorced. I know a lot of cases like that. I know a lot of cases like that. And that's why, you know, love is often blinding. Like, love is often blind, blinding. That is why in Islam, we have a clear system of how marriage should be done. And this extramarital, premarital affairs, like it'll just lead you to destruction. Anyway, don't look for a perfect partner. You will never ever find her or him. You will live a life of regret. Accept people for who they are and encourage them to develop. That's the best we can do. Nobody is perfect. Okay, so forgive people if they commit wrong against you or against themselves. And the Prophet ﷺ has said, Kullu bani Adam wa khayru tawabun. Every son of Adam commits sin, and the best of those who commit sin are those who repent. And also another thing that I would you know, tell the parents is stop comparing your children. Don't compare your children. Your children are not perfect. Your children are not perfect. So don't expect them to be perfect, right? A lot of parents, like they want their children to be like the perfect in the school, the perfect in the home, so much so that they, they apply to them a different standard of a superhuman being. So much so that if they commit a small mistake, they just beat them up. They just really get angry at them. Do you think that is a healthy environment for a child to grow up? The toxic mentality of a lot of these parents wanting their child, children to be perfect and constantly comparing their children. Why don't you be like your brother? Why don't you be like your sister? Why don't you be like that guy in the class? Why don't you be like the cousin of your maternal, uh, paternal uh, uncle of your brother, of your sister, of your mother-in-law? Like probably some distant relationship, you know, distant family member who she would have, your mother would have, you know, certainly pointed out because they got one person more mark than you in an examination that is not going to affect your life in any way possible. Like that's how much this comparing uh, trend has gone to. Never ever compare your children. It makes them feel underappreciated. We talked about social media fakeness. We'll not be covering that now. And social media, it's, it's highly, highly problematic. It really, really destroys you. Now, now, there's another thing we need to understand. With regards to not judging other people, does that mean you don't advise other people? Does that mean you don't advise other people? What do you think? Obviously, no. We are supposed to advise other people. We have to. It is our duty. Like this is very clearly stated. This is very clearly stated. It's an Islamic principle. It's very clear. Like when you're supposed to be a witness to mankind, you're supposed to be a person who is having the responsibility of guiding other people. That is who a Muslim is. If you see a sister not wearing hijab or you know getting into relationships or doing something that is haram, you don't just walk away like you didn't see that. No, you, you get involved. You get involved, right? And there are a lot of liberals who say, like, who are you to judge me? Just mind your own business. Just mind your own business. It's a very, very liberal argument. And then there's another fun argument that these Muslim liberals use. They say, don't judge me. Only Allah can judge me. Okay, it is true to an extent. But what they're basically saying is, don't advise me. Don't advise me. Who are you to advise me? Like, this is what they basically mean, right? This is what they basically mean. That is a very, very arrogant thing. And a lot of teenagers have it. A lot of teenagers have it. One of the most core qualities of Muslim is that when he is admonished, he accepts the admonition. When he's advised, he accepts the advice. He accepts the advice. So whenever someone advises us, don't be arrogant. Just accept the advice. And then, you know, we get into the topic of regret. You know, having regret in your heart after you commit a sin is actually a positive thing. It's a good thing. If you are able to cry due to a sin that you committed, it's a sign of Iman. It's a sign of Iman. You know, there are people who have committed a lot of sins so, so that they don't feel bad about it. They just consider it as, you know, something very trivial and small. No. When you commit a sin and you feel that sense of heaviness in your heart, understand that it's a sign of Iman. It's a sign of Iman. And punishing yourself mentally so much so that you go into depression is very, very destructive. It's very, very destructive. All right. Some people, they commit sins and they get really, really heavy feeling in the heart. And that is good. That is good. Do Tawbah. Do Tawbah. But at the same time, like, don't go into the depression so much so that you think that Allah is never going to 
you know, forgive you. Don't do it. Shaitan is actually messing up with your mind. Shaitan is messing with your mind. Like thinking that, you know, Allah will never forgive you. Making you think like that. Don't go into destructive regret that you completely destroy your heart. And destructive regret is often what leads to the cycle of sins. This can often seen with a lot of uh, pornography addicts who come for counseling. They say that, uh, you know, after, you know, watching this filth, like they have destroyed and, you know, gutted their souls, they feel really bad. And then they beat themselves up psychologically saying that I'm a bad person. I'm this, I'm that. And they say a lot of negative things to themselves. And you know what that basically does? That pain, that punishment, it becomes a justification to commit the sin again. They think that, okay, I've committed sin and I've also gotten punishment for it. And this was a psychological pain and it was in the form of a punishment. So now I've done the sin, I've got the punishment. So it's equal, I can do it again. Like there's this subconscious justification that happens in the mind of a lot of people. And it's, it's, it's a huge, huge problem. At the same time, there's something else. Destruct, constructive regret. Constructive regret is when you commit a sin and you get that heavy feeling in your heart and then you do tawbah, you cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you do tawbah, are you supposed to do tawbah by thinking that, okay, I'll do this, the, the same thing next week and I'll do tawbah again. Is that how we're supposed to do tawbah? What do you think? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You're supposed to do tawbah to completely stay away from that sin or else like it's not going to be accepted. It's not going to be accepted from you. You doing tawbah with a pure heart and thinking that you'll never you know, do it again. And then you doing it again by mistake. Okay, that's another whole thing. But then you doing tawbah with the mindset that you're going to do the same sin again after one week. No, your tawbah is not going to be accepted. Are you trying to cheat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is that really what you're trying to do? No, no. So understand that tawbah has clear cut criteria. We'll be covering that you know, as we move ahead in the later sessions, inshallah. But just understand that, that that regret you have in your heart is a sign of Iman. Is a sign of Iman. Regardless of how small or big it is. Alright? So try your best to be the best. Try your best to be the best. And understand that you are not an angel. Sometimes you might make mistakes knowingly or unknowingly. Knowingly or unknowingly. You are a human being. You're not perfect. Don't just kill yourself psychologically because you made a few mistakes. Right? You are a human being. Right, you are a human being, and look at this. We look with the same lens to other people. To other people, look at other people with the same lens. All right, don't expect perfection from other people. Don't expect perfection from other people. If they do something wrong, forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. All right, strive for perfection. Strive for perfection. Do your best, and God will do the rest. Be the best you can be. Set up the best timetable you can do. Follow the best schedule you can. You, you know you can make. Try your best, really, really work hard to be your best. Each and every day, consider it at, as your last day. Have a clear-cut schedule on how you want to live throughout the day, how you want to spend time that particular day. Try your best to be the best, all right? Try your best to be the best. That should be our motto, our aim, being a Muslim. And I'll be, I'd like to end with a pro tip. And the tip is this, doing your best Doing your best is more important than being the best. You know, some people, they always strive for perfection. Like they always want everything to be perfect. Everything to be perfect. Like in their minds, <clears throat> it's either 100 or zero. It's 100 or zero. And this is a very, very destructive mindset. It's a very, very destructive mindset. If they're doing something, they got to do it to the best. And it's okay. I do understand the intention, but everything you'll not be able to do it to your best. You're a human being. You're a human being, right? So, so try to be, try to do it your best. But at the same time, if you are not able to achieve perfection, don't just, you know, kill yourself psychologically so much that you cause yourself a lot of pain, a lot of pain. And there are a lot of people like, you know, I know, you know, people like, who don't study for exams, like the day before exam. And they say, you know, I, like, I'm not going to get good marks, right? I'm not going to get 100. So then, you know, they look at like zero. They look at zero, like what kind of mindset is that? What kind of mindset is that, right? Whatever you're doing, try to do it your best. But at the same time, understand that if you don't reach perfection, it is because you are a human being. That perfection mindset, like it's something like that is fed to us through the system that we are living in. And then, you know, people, there are some people who have, you know, some kind of personality traits for perfection, right? It can be 
really, really problematic, the perfectionistic mindset. The perfectionistic mindset is a pretty destructive mindset, even though the intention, the source of it is very good. So understand finally that doing your best is more important than being the best. And with that, we are concluding our discussion for today, inshallah. Uh, know that you are having an audio assignment. Post your audio assignment in the group today itself. Don't procrastinate, all right? Don't procrastinate. And do the video assignment also, all right? Do the video assignment also. You don't need to make a perfect video, all right? I'm not, I'm not expecting a TED Talk, you know, 4K HD presentation from any one of you, all right? You, obviously, you're going to make a lot of mistakes while recording the video or recording the audio. It's all right. This is your platform. COJ is your platform to make mistakes. COJ is a platform of brothers and sisters who will support you fully knowing that you will make mistakes because these are your brothers and sisters in deen. They don't love you for anything material. They love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the beauty of COJ. And I just wanted to convey uh, my happiness uh, uh, seeing that a lot of groups have become really active. A lot of people are taking part in an active manner. So, so happy to see that. Make sure you continue being active. You know, use the group uh, productively to your advantage to improve yourself and to develop in your life. Make sure you participate in the task. Like this is very, very important. This is very, very important. The tasks are one of the most primary elements of this particular course. If you just listen to the sessions without doing any, you know, of the work that you're supposed to do, then you're just wasting your time. You're just wasting your time. All right. So when you're going into the course, like give your best, give your best. Try to do the audio assignment. Try to do the video assignment. Submit it today. Some. Anyone who will submit the audio assignment today, say yes, inshallah, in the chat. Yes, inshallah, in the chat. And inshallah, it will really, really help you improve. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with the ability to stay away from sins. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa khina hadha bin nar. ربنا إننا نسألك حبك وحب من يحبك وحب عمل يقرب إلى حبك وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاك الله خير بدر for that very insightful session may Allah سبحانه وتعالى help us all become better individuals إن شاء الله now let us conclude the session with the conclusion talk. Uh, for that, I call Sister Fadia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I hope I'm audible and clear. Rabbi shrahli swadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul uqbadam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Alhamdulillah, we have come to the end of another session. And I'm sure you all would have got a lot of beautiful insights and knowledge. Now, whatever item we have acquired, we should make sure that we put it into practice, that we make it amal. And for that, doing the tasks, the daily tasks, weekly tasks, as well as the audio and video assignments is very important. So I hope uh, we all would be able to do that, inshallah. May Allah help us all uh, make all this knowledge useful and put it into practice. Uh, I would like to thank Brother Wafi Shihad for this amazing session. Jazakumullah khair. And also, uh, also uh, Sister Sufia and Sister Atiba for the introduction talk and the kirat, and also Sister Sahra, Sahla for the moderation. Uh, Jazakallah khair to all my dear brothers and sisters who listened attentively. May Allah bless you all. Uh, with this, I would like to end the session. Subhanakallahumma uh, bihamdika. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.